Chapter 7 Why is he choosing the hills? It was the next summer when I was 11 years old, 1874, that the first sign of a new trouble came to us. Our band had been camping on Split Toe Creek in the Black Hills, and from there we moved to Spring Creek, then to Rapid Creek, where it comes out into the prairie. That evening, just before sunset, a big thundercloud came up from the west. And just before the wind struck, there were clouds of split-tail swallows flying all around above us. It was like a part of my vision, and it made me feel queer. The boys tried to hit the swallows with stones, and it hurt me to see them doing this, but I couldn't tell them. I got a stone, and I acted as though I were going to throw, but I didn't. The swallows seemed holy. Nobody hit one, and when I thought about this, I knew that, of course, they could not. The next day, some of the people were building a sweat teepee for a medicine man by the name of Chips. He was going to perform a ceremony and had to be purified first. They say he was the first man who made a sacred ornament for our great chief Crazy Horse. While they were heating the stones for the sweat teepee, some boys asked me to go with them to shoot squirrels. We went out, and when I was about to shoot one, I felt very uneasy all at once. So I sat down, feeling queer, and wondered about it. While I sat there, I heard a voice that said, Go at once, go home. I told the boys we must go home at once, and we all hurried. When we got back, everybody was excited, breaking camp, catching the ponies, and loading the drags. And I heard that while Chips was in the sweat teepee, a voice had told him that the band must flee at once because something was going to happen there. It was nearly sundown when we started, and we fled all that night on the back trail towards Spring Creek. Then, down that creek to the south fork of the Good River. I rode most of the night in a pony drag because I got too sleepy to stay on a horse. We camped that good river in the morning, but we stayed only long enough to eat. Then we fled again upstream, all day long, until we reached the mouth of the Horse Creek. We were going to stay there, but scouts came to us and said that many soldiers had come into the Black Hills, and that was what Chip saw while he was in the sweat teepee. So we hurried on in the night towards Smoky Earth River, the White, and when we got there, I woke up, and it was daybreak. We camped a while to eat, and then went up the smoky earth to camps to Robinson, for we were afraid of the soldiers up there. Afterward, I learned that it was Pahuska who had led his soldiers into the Black Hills that summer to see what he could find. He had no right to go in there, because all that country was ours. Also, the Wazichus had made a treaty with Red Cloud, 1868 that said it would be ours as long as grass should grow and water flow. Later, I learned too that Pahuska had found there much of the yellow metal that makes Wazichus crazy. And that is what made the bad trouble, just as it did before when the hundred were rubbed out. Our people knew there was yellow metal in little chunks up there, but they did not bother with it because it was not good for anything. We stayed all winter at the soldier's town and all the while bad trouble was coming fast. For in the fall, we heard that some Wazichus had come from the Missouri River to dig in the Black Hills for yellow metal, because Pahuska had told about it with a voice that went everywhere. Later, he got rubbed out for doing that. The people talked about this all winter. Crazy Horse was in the Powder River country, and Sitting Bull was somewhere north of the hills. Our people at Soldier Town thought we ought to get together and do something. Red Cloud's people said that the soldiers had gone there in there to keep the diggers out, but we, who were only visiting, did not believe it. We called Red Cloud's people hangs around the fort, and our people said they were standing up for the Wazi Chews, and if we did not do something, we should lose the Black Hills. In the spring, when I was 12 years old, 1875, more soldiers with many wagons came up from the soldiers' town at the mouth of the Laramie River and went into the hills. There was much talk all summer. And in the moon of making fat, June, 
There was a sun dance there at the soldier's town to give the people strength, but not many took part, maybe because everybody was so excited talking about the Black Hills. I remember two men who danced together. One had lost a leg in the Battle of the Hundred Slain, and one had lost an eye in the attacking of the wagons. So they had only three eyes and three legs between them to dance with. We boys went down to the creek while they were sun dancing and got some elm leaves that we chewed up and threw on the dancers while they were all dressed up and trying to look their best. We even did this to some of the older people and nobody got angry because everybody was supposed to be in good humor and to show their endurance in every kind of way. So they had to stand teasing too. I will tell about a big sun dance later when we come to it. In the moon when the calves grow hair, September, there was a big council with the Wazichus on the smoky earth river at the mouth White Clay Creek. I can remember the council, but I did not understand much of it then. Many of the Lakotas were there, also Shiolas and Blue Clouds, but Crazy Horse and Sitting Bull stayed away. In the middle of the circle there was a shade made of canvas. Under this the councillors sat and talked, and all around them there was a crowd of people on foot and horseback. They talked and talked for days, but it was like wind blowing in the end. I asked my father what they were talking about in there, and he told me that the grandfather at Washington had wanted to lease the Black Hills so that the Wazichus could dig yellow metal, and that the chief of the soldiers had said, if we do not do this, the Black Hills would be just like melting snow on our hands because the Wazichus would take that country anyway. It made me sad to hear this. It was such a good place to play, and the people were always happy in that country. Also, I thought of my vision and of how the spirits took me there to the center of the world. After the council, we heard that creeks of Wazichus were flowing into the hills and becoming rivers, and that they were already making towns up there. It looked like bad trouble coming, so our band broke camp and started out to join Crazy Horse on Powder River. We camped on Horsehead Creek, then on the War Bonnet, after we crossed the old Wazichus Road that made the trouble that time when the hundred were rubbed out. Grass was growing on it. Then we camped at Sage Creek, then on the Beaver, then on the Driftwood Creek, and came again to the plain of pine trees at the edge of the hills. The nights were sharp now, but the days were clear and still. And while we were camping there, I went up into the hills alone and sat a long while under a tree. I thought maybe my vision would come back and tell me how I could save that country from my people, but I could not see anything clear. This made me sad, but something happened a few days later that made me feel good. We had gone over to taking the Crow Horses Creek, where we found many bison and made plenty of meat and tanned many hides for winter. In our van, there was a man by the name of Fat, who was always talking about how fast his horse could run. One day, while we were camping there, I told Fat my pony could run faster than his could. He laughed at me and said that only crows and coyotes would think my pony was any good. I asked him what he would give me if my pony could beat his, and he said he would give me some black medicine coffee. So we ran, and I got the black medicine. All the while we were running, I thought about the white wing of the wind that the second grandfather of my vision gave me, and maybe that power went into my pony's legs. On Kills Himself Creek, we made more meat and hides I was ready to join Crazy Horse's camp on the powder. There were some hang around the fort people with us, and when they saw that we were going to join Crazy Horse, they left us and started back to the soldier's town. They were afraid there might be trouble, and they knew Crazy Horse would fight, and so they wanted to be safe with the Wazichus. We did not like them very much. We had no advisors because we were just a little band, and when we were moving, the boys could ride anywhere. One day, while we were heading for Powder River, I was riding with Steele's horses, another boy my age, and we saw some footprints of somebody going somewhere. 
We followed the footprints, and there was a knoll beside the creek where Lakota was lying. We got off and looked at him, and he was dead. His name was Rude of the Tail, and he was going over to Tongue River to see his relatives when he died. He was very old and ready to die, so he just lay down and died right there before he saw his relatives again. After a while, we came to the village on Powder River and went into camp at the downstream end. I was anxious to see my cousin Crazy Horse again, for now that it began to look like bad trouble coming, everybody talked about him more than ever, and he seemed greater than before. Also, I was getting older. Of course, I had seen him now and then ever since I could remember, and had heard stories of the brave things he did. I remember the story of how he and his brother were out alone on horseback, and a big band of crows attacked them, so they had to run. And while they were riding hard, with all those crows after them, Crazy Horse heard his brother call out, and when he looked back, his brother's horse was down, and the crows were almost on him. And they told how Crazy Horse charged right back into the crows and fought them back with only a bow and arrows, then took his brother up behind him and got away. It was his sacred power that made the crows afraid of him when he charged. And the people told stories of when he was a boy and used to be around with the older Hump all the time. Hump was not young anymore at that time, and he was a very great warrior, maybe the greatest we ever had until then. They say people used to wonder at the boy and the old man always being together, but I think Hump knew Crazy Horse would be a great man and wanted to teach him everything. Crazy Horse's father was my father's cousin, and there were no chiefs in our family before Crazy Horse, but there were holy men, and he became a chief because of the power he got in a vision when he was a boy. When I was a man, my father told me something about that vision. Of course, he did not know all of it, but he said that Crazy Horse dreamed and went into the world where there is nothing but the spirits of all things. That is the real world that is behind this one. And everything we see here is something like a shadow from that world. He was on his horse in that world, and the horse and himself on it, and the trees and the grass and the stones and everything were made of spirit. And nothing was hard, and everything seemed to float. His horse was standing still there, and yet it danced around like a horse made only a shadow. And that is how he got his name, which does not mean that his horse was crazy or wild, but that in his vision it danced around in a queer way. It was this vision that gave him his great power, for when he went into a fight, he had only to think of that world to be in it again, so that he could go through anything and not be hurt. Until he was murdered by the Wazichus at Soldier's Town on White River, he was wounded only twice, once by accident, and both times by someone of his own people when he was not expecting trouble and was not thinking, never by an enemy. He was 15 years old when he was wounded by accident, and the other time when he was a young man, and another man was jealous of him because the man's wife liked Crazy Horse. They used to say, too, that he carried a sacred stone with him, like one he had seen in some vision, and that when he was in danger, the stone always got very heavy and protected him somehow. That, they used to say, was the reason no horse he ever rode lasted very long. I do not know about this. Maybe people only thought that. But it is a fact that he never kept one horse long. They wore out. I think it was only the power of his great vision that made him great. Now and then, he would notice me and speak to me before this. And sometimes, he would have the crier call me into his teepee and eat with him. Then he would say things to tease me, but I would not say anything back because I think I was a little afraid of him. I wasn't afraid that he would hurt me, I was just afraid. Everybody felt that way about him. For he was a queer man and he would go about the village without noticing people or saying anything. In his own teepee he would joke, and when he was on the war path with a small party, he would joke to make the warriors feel good. But around the village he hardly ever noticed anybody except little children. All the Lakotas liked to dance and sing, but he never joined to dance, and they say nobody ever heard him sing. But everybody liked him, and they would do anything he wanted, or go anywhere, he said. 
He was a small man among the Lakotas, and he was slender, and had a thin face, and his eyes looked through things, and he always seemed to be thinking hard about something. He never wanted to have many things for himself, and he didn't want to have many ponies like a chief. They say that when game was scarce and all the people were hungry, he wouldn't eat at all. He was a queer man. Maybe he was always part way into that world of his vision. He was a very great man, and I think if the Wazichus had not murdered him down there, maybe we would still have the Black Hills and be happy. They could not have killed him in battle. They had to lie to him and murder him, and he was only about 30 years old when he died. One day, after we had camped there on Powder River, I went up to see him again, but his teepee was empty, and he was gone somewhere, maybe with a war party against the crows, for we were close to them now and had to look out for them all the time. Later, I did see them. He put his arm across my shoulder and took me into his teepee, and we sat down together. I do not remember what he said, but I know he did not say much, and he did not tease me. Maybe he was thinking about the terrible trouble coming. We did not stay together there very long, but scattered out and camped in different places so that the people and the ponies would all have plenty. Crazy Horse kept his village on Powder River with about a hundred, and our band made camp on the tongue. We built a corral of poles for the horses at night and herded them all day because the crows were great horse thieves and we had to be careful. The women chopped and stripped cottonwood trees during the day and gave bark to the horses at night. The horses liked it and it made them sleek and fat. Beside the mouth of the corral there was a teepee for the horse guard and one night Kronos was staying there and his wife was with him. He had a hole in the teepee so that he could look through. After a while, he got very sleepy, so he woke his wife and told her to get up and watch while he had a little rest. By and by, she saw something dark moving slowly out on the snow out there. So she woke her husband and whispered, Old man, you'd better get up. I think I see something. So Kronos got up and peeked out and saw a man moving around the corral in the starlight looking for the best horse. Kronos told his wife, keep her eye at the hole and let him know when the man was coming out with the horse and he lay down at the opening of the teepee with the muzzle of his gun sticking out of the flap. By and by they could hear the bar lifted at the mouth of the corral. When his wife touched him, Kronos thrust his head outside and saw the man just getting on the horse to ride away. He was black against the sky so Kronos shot him and the shot woke the whole camp so that many came running with guns and coup sticks. Yellow Shirt was the first to count coup on the dead crow, but many followed. A man who has killed an enemy must not touch him, for he already had the honor of killing. He must let another count coup. When I got there to see, a pile of coup sticks was lying beside the crow, and the women had cut him up with axes and scattered him around. It was horrible. Then the people built a fire there beside the crow, and we had a kill dance. Men, women, and children danced right in the middle of the night, and they sang songs about Kronos, who had killed the yellow shirt, and had counted the first coup. Then it was daylight, and the crier told us we would move camp to the place where Root of the Tail died. Kronos dressed up for war, painted his face black, and rode the horse the enemy had tried to steal. When the men paint their faces black, the women all rejoice and make the tremolo because it means their men are going to kill enemies. When we camped again, one of Red Cloud's loafers, who had started back for the soldier's town because they were afraid there might be trouble, came in and said the crows had killed all his party but himself while they were sleeping, and he had escaped because he was out scouting. During the winter, Runners came from the Wazichus and told us we must come into the soldier's town right away or there would be bad trouble. But it was foolish to say that because it was very cold and many of our people and ponies would have died in the snow. Also, we were in our own country and we were doing no harm. Late in the moon of the dark red calves, February, there was a big thaw 
and our little band started for Soldier's Town, but it was very cold again before we got there. Crazy Horse stayed with about a hundred teepees on power, and in the middle of the moon of the snow blind, March, something bad happened there. It was just daybreak. There was a blizzard and it was very cold. The people were sleeping. Suddenly there were many shots and horses galloping through the village. It was the cavalry of the Wazichus, and they were yelling and shooting and riding their horses against the teepees. All the people rushed out and ran because they were not awake yet and they were frightened. The soldiers killed as many women and children and men as they could while the people were running toward the bluff. Then they set fire to some of the teepees and knocked the others down. But when the people were on the side of the bluff, Crazy Horse said something and all the warriors began singing the death song and charged back upon the soldiers. And the soldiers ran, driving many of the people's ponies ahead of them. Crazy Horse followed them all that day with a band of warriors, and that night he took all the stolen ponies away from them and some of their own horses and brought them all back to the village. These people were in their own country and were doing no harm. They only wanted to be left alone. We did not hear of this until quite a while afterward, but at the soldier's town we heard enough to make us paint our faces black.